It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Apocalypse is one of those things that looms large in our collective unconsciousness. It is a thing that sometimes fills us with existential dread, but most often makes a great story, either in the sense of the apocalypse has happened and so we need to, you know, cope now with the after effects in a post-apocalyptic world, or in the sense of the apocalypse is impending and we need to try and save the day. Of course, you could also write a tragedy where the apocalypse actually does happen, and that's more rarely done, but certainly would make a great tale as well. But oftentimes, people use very much same, same kind of apocalypse. An asteroid, war, all of these things kind of come in the same kind of flavor. So today, I thought I would take a look at the types of apocalypse available to you and the advantages offered by these various types in crafting an apocalypse for your fantasy world, either in the far past or currently impending. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If this kind of content interests you and you would like to help me in supporting more of it, you can hit my Ko-fi page, link down below, where you can leave a once-off donation or become a monthly member. In addition, I am a fantasy author, so my books are available on Amazon.com for you to read and enjoy. Please do leave a review. Okay, enough of that. Let's get cracking with the apocalypse. The first thing to consider is the size of the apocalypse. So an apocalypse is essentially anything that fundamentally alters the society that it is in by means of an event, right? So it could be a localized apocalypse, so a sort of a regional apocalypse. An example of this from the real world is the Bronze Age collapse, where the Bronze Age civilizations around the Mediterranean all collapsed into anarchy and gave rise to a dark ages that lasted until the 9th century BC when the Greek cities restarted coming into a more um, unified and civilized state and the classical period of history started. Now, the Bronze Age collapse is particularly interesting because Obviously, it was so long ago, we don't have very direct records, but we know that the Bronze Age cities, one after the other, came under attack by the mysterious Sea People. And the Bronze Age kings wrote to each other for aid, requesting aid from city to city as these Sea People kept coming, and gradually these, these cities fell to these Sea People. And this led to the collapse of that very advanced Bronze Age society where you had big cities that were engaged in intense trade, as we can see by deciphering the writing between the cities. It was a very highly civilized environment around the Mediterranean and the Middle East. That whole area was super civilized with great trading networks and a, a fair chunk of technological advances. And they fell in an apocalyptic manner to the sea people. You can also even go smaller with your apocalypse. You can have it be a town that is destroyed, as happened with the eruption of Vesuvius that buried the Roman city of Pompeii. This is obviously a very small type of apocalypse applying only to those people. But there were 20,000 people living in Pompeii. I mean, for them, it was an apocalyptic event. So what this small kind of apocalypse allows you to do is it allows you to tell a local story about the people in that apocalypse. It allows you to have an intimate setting that is focused on a few lives that is being fundamentally disrupted by this thing that is happening to them. And they could move away, but even doing that is already destructive to their lives. But you don't just have to go regional. You can, of course, have a global apocalypse. So a global apocalypse is when all or most life vanishes from the surface of the planet. So it would be a much larger effect than a regional one. And we do have historical examples, but they are not obviously of human history per se. The Great dying happened 252 million years ago, 
70% of terrestrial vertebrates and 80% of marine invertebrates died during the Great Dying. Now, it's disputed how long this took. It was either 15,000 years all the way up to 15 million years. So, you know, but it was 250 million years ago. So we're kind of guessing at a lot of things. But the archaeologists who examined the Great Dying think that the cause might have been climate change because microbes evolved that put methane into the atmosphere. And as we know from our current day and age, methane causes heating. And that had a massive negative impact on the creatures that had evolved to live in that kind of colder water and colder climate environment. And that ended in this great dying. So you can certainly have something like that, which is an almost natural cause and a very global effect. But of course, even 15,000 years is a very long time for an apocalypse to happen. It's a very slow-moving apocalypse. So maybe you want a faster one. The most famous apocalypse-type event is probably 66 million years ago when a meteorite, probably, hit the Earth in Yucatan, in the Yucatan Peninsula, and wiped out 67% of uh, all living species, including the non-avian dinosaurs, which of course gave a niche gap in the evolutionary plane, as it were, which was filled by mammals, and that's why I'm here talking to you through YouTube. So those are two real-world examples of actual global catastrophes and apocalypses. But what if you want to go even bigger than that? You can have a total existential apocalypse as well. So existential apocalypse is all life ends everywhere. Now, you can either do that on a kind of planetary basis. So an example of this would be in Star Wars. If you have the Death Star rock up and blow the planet apart, that's it. The planet is gone. Everything on it is gone. It is existentially vanished. But you can even have this on a universe level. So examples of this would include things like there's a theory... Okay, so I personally think this is a silly theory, but there's no evidence for it and there's none against it. So, you know, whatever. There's a theory that we are all in a simulation. The argument goes like this. If it's possible to build a simulation of a world and a universe and so on, a computer-based simulation, then people would have done it and people would do it. And we know that it is possible because if you wanted to spend enough time, you could build a comprehensive simulation of life as we know it. So eventually what would happen is people inside simulations would build simulations of life originating and starting and various lives forming. And so there would be more simulated worlds than there are real worlds. And so the likelihood is that we live in a simulation. That is the highest probability that we live in a simulation. Okay. So the apocalypse would be somebody switching off that simulation. Now, obviously, while this is an existential threat, if we did live in a simulation, for the story to work, you'd need things in the simulation to become aware of the external existential threat and give them some kind of pathway to interact with it. Otherwise, you describe the world and switch off the simulation and move on with your life. But anyway, so... So the simulation being switched off would be an existential threat. In a more actual, possible existential threat, it could be that outside of our observable universe, there is true vacuum. And if that true vacuum got sucked into our galaxy, into our world, it could consume everything that we are. It could consume all of the planets, etc., and that would obviously result in a complete existential apocalypse. Everything would just be gone. So those are the three types of apocalypse. You have regional, global, existential. And if you enjoyed like talking about those various types of apocalypse, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk a little bit more about the actual types of apocalypse available to you now that we have the size defined. 
Okay, so the first type of apocalypse, to my mind, is the external force apocalypse. So this is some kind of external force acting on your civilization. It can be spiritual. So an example of this would be something like Cthulhu. If Cthulhu rose from the island of Relay and ate the entire human race, that would be an external force apocalypse. I set up such a apocalyptic type creature in my world called Asapit Mala that's trapped behind the bloodgate. And if the bloodgate opens, she potentially absorbs all life available on the planet. At least that is what is believed by the people who live there. So you can have such a spiritual creature or a god that is kept captive or something of immense power, some cosmic entity of immense power that can cause the apocalypse if they are released or if they reach there. Another example of this would be the Silver Surfers Galacticus, you know, that travels through the uh, universe and eats planets as a means of survival. That would be such a force, such a spiritual entity or giant being that exists outside of the parameters of your civilization. Speaking of spiritual forces, there are a lot of religions that include apocalyptic scenarios. An example of this, of course, is famously the Norse religion, which includes the Ragnarok component. These apocalypses are always presaged by signs and portents. So like in Ragnarok, you're supposed to have a long and continuous winter with constant snow. Then there's a red rooster that warns the giants and a second rooster that will call the dead. And finally, a third rooster will warn the gods. And that will be the beginning of the end. And then, of course, those apocalypses normally result in the final battle between good and evil to end all battles and settle the debate of who's better, us or them. You can also lean into that kind of apocalypse set up between two polar opposite spiritual forces like the giants and the gods or heaven and hell um, and, and have the apocalypse be that battle between these two entities. But if neither of those do sound attractive to you, you can always go with alien attack. So this is where an alien force comes from externally and they're coming with higher technology or more people, like a swarm of locusts coming for the planet. You could go for something like the Warhammer 40k Tyranids that come and strip a planet down as they eat it, you know, and that represents an apocalypse for that planet. You could also go with something like in Anne McCaffrey's books, the Freedom's Choice books, the Kateni series, the Kateni race pitch up at Earth and they basically blow the cities apart and Earth surrenders and that effectively puts Earth into like a post-apocalyptic surrendered mode. And I mean, you can see an example of that as an impending apocalypse with the Independence Day movie where you have the bugs pitching up and then people designing a virus to, you know, stop the bugs and so on. Alien attack is definitely a way to go with making a apocalyptic scenario. But aliens and space can also bring zombies. And zombies are an absolute classic of your external force post-apocalyptic scenarios. So you could go with something like The Last of Us, where it's a fungus, you know, which has some basis in the natural world, as I discussed in my video on mushrooms. But it can also be a virus carried on an asteroid, or it can be something that comes from the aliens who unleash this zombie plague on Earth, resulting in zombies coming for us all. What is the benefit of using an external force as an apocalypse? Well, it results in an unexpected apocalypse. So this isn't something that you can necessarily plan for. So your people, your characters are confronted with this apocalypse in the middle of their lives. So it's kind of like getting hit by a bus moment, right? So you've got, you set up your normal lives of your characters, they're doing their normal things, and then suddenly apocalyptic threat. So this allows you to tell a story of people scrambling for solutions you know, working against the clock as the apocalypse draws ever nearer. 
it also allows you to create great sympathy for your characters because your characters are fighting against an existential threat they have no control over. They couldn't have done anything to either hasten or slow the alien invasion. It's just coming. You know, they couldn't stop Cthulhu breaking out of his prison. The spells failed and now they're faced with this ancient horror. So it allows you to generate that immediate sympathy for the heroes and it allows you to have this scrambling for solutions answers. And if you enjoyed that discussion of the external forces and apocalypse, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about nature as the apocalyptic force. So in nature, I'm actually including things like the asteroid hitting the Earth or the sun going nova or such kind of celestial events, because these are natural events that are not created by a semi-intelligent external force. They're things that occur because of natural events occurring, like an asteroid coming towards Earth or the sun going nova, or other such natural events. And of course, I mean, asteroids are a classic. <laughs> it killed the dinosaurs. And the movie Armageddon tells a story of us trying to stop an asteroid coming towards Earth by nuking it, of course. <laughs> it's, it's not that great science, but it was a fun movie that I thoroughly enjoyed. So depending on the size of this event, this kind of celestial event, you could have bigger or smaller apocalypses. So if your asteroid is a small localized storm, it would probably just destroy a region. If it's 10 kilometers across, we're looking at a global extinction event. As part of this natural event, you can, of course, also lean into things like volcanoes, earthquakes, and climate change. And here, size is really everything. Vesuvius exploding buried Pompeii. The volcano under Yellow Lake exploding would probably be a global extinction event, not necessarily because of the lava, but because it would push so much ash into the air that we would experience such a long period of winter that civilization would break down. And it's worth thinking about not just the kind of lava and the immediate effects around the volcano, but also about the effects that it has on civilization. When that volcano erupted in 2010 in Iceland, it disrupted the EU air traffic, not for very long, but it was such a disruption that the EU took significant economic damage from that reasonably minor eruption. So it's worth looking into volcanoes as a potential source for Armageddon-style events. Of course, the same applies to earthquakes and in both cases, earthquakes and volcanoes, you can tie those into elemental magic quite easily because they are fire and earth and all of these things are very forceful. And I spoke about that in my elemental magic video, which you can check out in the information card. You can also lean into climate change as an apocalyptic event and the movie 2012 did that in some ways. So they basically sped up the whole heating of the earth by saying, okay, the Earth's core gets heated up by like a solar flare, and this creates rapidly accelerating climate change, and the world ends. Climate change is a slower apocalypse, but I expect that as we start to see the effects impact us as a civilization, you know, as sea levels rise and so on, I expect there will be more content around climate change as an apocalyptic event. Part of natural events is also plagues. And plagues, of course, can be a bug that comes out of nowhere, a bug that has evolved in some terrible way. It can even be a zombie plague. So it can be something that creates zombies the way World War Z did in the, the book and the movie and the game, which it is all three of. That can be a really interesting story as people are trying to find a cure, find a vaccine and so on. Now, in a minor way, we've seen that over the past two years, COVID wasn't anywhere near as deadly as to be a true apocalypse. But you can extrapolate from the events around COVID to build a central kind of storyline of hunting for a cure, hunting for a vaccine, 
people kind of barricading themselves in their homes and so on. Okay, so why would you go with a nature type apocalypse? Well, there is a great deal of benefit in having a non-human villain, in having a natural force as a villain. The thing is about a natural force is it doesn't care about you. Yeah? So it's not like the earthquake is out to get you. It's not like the volcano is out to get you. So it allows you to tell stories where it's not about the villain and their plans. It's about the human spirit and its reaction to these disastrous events. It, is, it allows you to tell stories of people overcoming this immense external implacable thing that is uncaring towards them. And that can always make for a very interesting story. And if you enjoyed that discussion of natural causes and the apocalypse, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about self-caused apocalyptic stories. The classic one in the self-caused apocalypse stories is, of course, war. It's always a popular one that causes the apocalypse. Generally, people lean into nukes or into chemical weapons or such things that also, you know, poison the earth and so on. And then you have people living with the aftermath. But you don't have to go with a war as the only self-caused thing. You can lean into that whole chemical thing and be like, okay, well, people have actually poisoned the earth. They have created a toxic environment for the earth. And you can see an example of this in The Handmaid's Tale. Now, in The Handmaid's Tale, the reason why handmaids exist, the reason why they're brought into you know, people's houses and why they're enslaved and so on is because they can bear children. Because the world through industry and so on has poisoned the earth and caused many women to go infertile. So most women are now infertile and only a few are fertile and can bear children. And that, of course, results in an absolute existential threat to the human race. And that's why this is a post-apocalyptic type scenario. You could also go with a different cause. You could also go with science causing a apocalypse. So an example of this, I don't know if you remember the panic that existed around the Large Hadron Collider potentially causing a micro black hole that's going to suck in pieces of, you know, the earth and then it's going to grow and we're all going to vanish into this black hole because scientists just can't leave well enough alone and all of that kind of story. So you could also tell a story of a micro black hole caused by science or other kind of kind of science experiments gone wrong, creating an apocalyptic scenario. And that, of course, leads me into things like artificial intelligence being the cause of your apocalypse. So this, of course, is told in stories like The Matrix and Terminator, where you have the rise of the machines that take over. And it's also very well told in the Stargate series where you have the replicators that rise as a force that destroys the Asgardian civilization. And the replicators are these machines that self-build and they consume everything to build more of themselves. Certainly, you, you can lean into artificial intelligence as something that humans should not have tangled with and now we are here where we've had this machine war and the machines have taken over or we're battling the machine. So you kind of combine war and artificial intelligence in one fell swoop apocalypse. But why would you do a we did it to ourselves type of apocalypse? Well, it plays great into certain themes. Themes like just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it is a theme that works very well with this. Things like war is always bad plays well here and the kind of danger of too much knowledge or knowledge in the wrong hands or power in the wrong hands, that kind of theme plays very well in a self-made apocalypse. And those are my types of apocalypse. So what are your types of apocalypse? What do you think? Did I, did I miss any? Did I mischaracterize any? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button and maybe check out my video on creatures in the deep. If you want to connect around this or any other world building topics, I do have a Discord server linked down below. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just in Time World.